Sergio's going to talk about cloud production and WebRTC, Librist. So take it away. Hi, I'm Sergio Amorada, Chief Scientist of Zip Radios, and uh, now it's a broadcast spin off Amox. I'm also the author and maintainer of the Librist open source library. Uh, some of you uh, may have seen me at previous venues demoing and speaking about RIST and Libris in, in general, and we'll touch on that very briefly today. But this year, the call was for presentations that focus more on uh, case studies. Uh, so we'll be discussing a case study that involved RIST, and in this particular case, it's a combination of RIST and WebRTC. So to put things into context, the case study involves one of the big three US networks. Uh, they were the first ones to use this technology, at least for this particular show, uh, type of show. Uh, the network puts a lot of its production in its own cloud. Part of it uh, is located in New York and New Jersey. And uh, the, the events that I'm describing took place in 2020 in the middle of a lockdown in New York City. Uh, the studio is in New York, of course. And instead of an army of engineers and production assistants in the, st in the studio, they were all at home, as we know. So with only a skeleton crew in the studio, they needed to deliver easy to use, low latency and reliable broadcast quality video feeds to the crews in their homes. All right? So uh, RISP played a role but only a secondary one in this case. Uh, RIS transported several streams from the studio to the cloud where the producer was able to use software running in the cloud to mix the streams for inclusion in uh, live programs. And uh, the field personnel saw the work in progress over WebRTC in real time. The WebRTC, as you know, is quick. It doesn't require any installation or plugin. Uh, you don't even need a web page. You know with a video control or any code. If you know, your media server has everything you need, it just play, uh, plays straight out of a web browser with a URL link. Uh, it also has uh, great security and other features, but we'll touch on those a little later. So to set the stage, July 2020, networks are desperate, and using Zoom or Skype for transmitting talk shows from their homes, what just not, it wasn't cutting it anymore. Uh, we had done some work with this particular network uh, with our RISP products, and that opened the door for us, uh, but it didn't quite fulfill the requirements. But uh, fortunately, uh, we also had some other technologies uh, on our belt uh, that we proposed to help them with the problem, and we ended up you know, uh, providing the solution for this. But let's keep to the results first, and then work our way backwards on what we accomplished. So here's a write-up that appeared uh, the next day after this happened. Uh, the Tonight Show, with the, which is the longest running network talk show, uh, beats all the other back to the studio. Uh, the subtitle says it all, right? Jimmy Fallon returned to his Rockefeller Center studio Monday after a month of shooting the Tonight Show from his home. He's the first late night show to host, uh, host to return to the studio amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So now we're gonna describe, you know, how we helped to make this happen for this network. So as we mentioned before, there was only a skeleton crew in the studio, hardly even that. Uh, you know, you, you can't tell by when the program aired, but there's basically was him, a cameraman, and another guy in the control room. That was about it. Uh, the guests were all remote, either zoomed in or Skype or whatever technology they were using, and all the producers, directors, and everybody you know, managing the, the recording of the show was still remote in lockdown in their homes. So speed is what makes uh, our WebRTC technology unique. The encoder was converting the SDI input directly into uh, DTSC. Uh, DTSC is a protocol that our WebRTC media server supports. The API can handle this protocol directly. Uh, we're pretty sure that we're the only ones that have integrated this type of uh, you know, straight to media server 
WebRTC media server uh, communication. Without this, you will need to convert your uh, encode to either MPEG-TS or RTMP, and then send it to a media server to convert, to convert to WebRTC. By avoiding this step, we basically saved four to 500 milliseconds in the glass-to-glass -glass process of delivering these WebRTC streams. Uh, in this case, uh, only the guy in the control and remote camera operators were taking advantage of our direct uh, communication to the media server, but we'll show that in the next slide. I'm not gonna get ahead of myself there. Uh, the other five or 10 guys working from, from home saw a once removed stream because we also converted to MPEG-TS and also sent to a separate WebRTC server, uh, more scalable for the rest of the crew uh, that had a lower bandwidth. Bandwidth was always a, also a concern because all these remote operators were using the VPN within the infrastructure and the VPN had some severe bandwidth limitations per stream, you know, purposely imp imposed because there's thousands of remote works connecting and uh, only certain people had uh, the higher bandwidth uh, VPNs or their lower bandwidth. So we had to accommodate two, two tiers of viewers. Uh, but the, the key here was that all the other operators needed to get the feed for editing and for decision making after the fact. So the timing wasn't critical for those. The extra four, 500 milliseconds was acceptable. So let's go over this diagram. It's just all the moving parts that made this happen, okay? Uh, it documents the flow as it was live from the studio that first night. Uh, we're not doing a lot of other uh, live tape to shows, uh, such as game shows in a similar matter, uh, manner. We also do remotes such as uh, election night, and uh, we cover the Met Gala, the Tonys, etc., with a similar uh, technology. Uh, we'll address the differences uh, for the other venues as well uh, in the coming slides. So for this particular case, the guest uses a Zoom-like tool like before, uh, because they're at their home. At the studio, uh, it's all SDI and there's some NDI as well. Uh, uh, some existing equipment basically converts the incoming signal that is either Zoom or Skype or Teams, whatever it is, it has a, a native, now they have a native yeah, NDI output. So our encoders could, could pick up that NDI output from uh, the remote feeds coming from the guests and we would encode that and send it to the media server. Uh, the host uh, sees the guest on a monitor directly from, from that feed as well uh, for real-time uh, feedback. Uh, the control room also picks up that local feed uh, through an SDI monitor connected to, this, to the same feed that goes to uh, you know, broadcast. But when we come in is we pick up that NDI feed, we pick up uh, the SDI of all the cameras, we pick up all of those, run it through our encoders, which have been optimized and fine-tuned for WebRTC compatibility and low latency delivery of these streams. And we feed those to two different WebRTC servers. The first WebRTC server is on-site. Uh, that's a low latency one. And then we create a second copy of the transport stream uh, as a transport stream of all this. And then we send it over wrist to another cloud-based uh, WebRTC server farm. So we have this one here with a low latency uh, WebRTC playbacks, which you know, is a person's on site and a handful of uh, a camera operators that were remote there were some robotic cameras that required you know, really low latency because you can crash into anything if you don't have that when controlling those cameras remotely. And, and then the rest were, were hooking up to the cloud-based uh, WebRTC server, which had an extra about 400 milliseconds latency. The key to the super low latency, which in this case was a glass-to-glass -glass of about 400 milliseconds, glass-to-browser in this case, 400 milliseconds uh, if you were on a LAN in your home, or about 700 milliseconds if you 
were connected through a Wi-Fi, it's auto-adjusting its buffer, was the fact that we avoided the conversion to MPEG-TS or RTMP or anything. We basically encoded everything and in, in pushed the raw streams directly to the media server to be encapsulated as WebRTC. So in, in the case of the studio, the risk link was over internal fiber. So the latency introduced by this wrist was insignificant because we can fine tune the parameters uh, to be a very low buffer. The, low, the buffer of uh, risk connection is ideally should be six times around trip time. And in this case, in this particular uh, taping, this was a fiber, so we, we, if, if we put it at 50 milliseconds, it was enough and it didn't impact the overall latency uh, significantly. In other similar scenarios where the, we, the, the stream for the remote went over the open internet, as in the case of the Met Gala or you know, the, the game shows that were filmed all over the US, that went through the internet and uh, the cloud was actually AWS in that case. That introduced a little bit more latency, but still it was the exact same workflow uh, to do remote production with most of the crew off-site. So wh what did this look like? Not bad, actually. Complicated as a diagram looks, it looked like a normal studio show. Let me play you a very short clip. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Tonight Show. As you can see, we are back in the studio at 30 Rockefeller Plaza here in New York City. And as a New Yorker, I want to say thank you to everyone who helped get us back to where we are now. So for the parts at which the remote Zoom or Skype or Teams, whatever it was, carried video for the guest, it also looked good enough. Uh, the first guest was the governor of New York at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> he's sort of not a, a, a known person now, but, you know, <laughs> let's see what it looked like. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. This is our first show back in the studio. All right, so the left side, as you can see, you could probably tell the difference in the quality between the left and the right side, but it was good enough. It was already a, a show that resembled some, some level of, of normalcy. To, to, to sum up then, what we saw in the case study was, uh, where speed is a primary concern, Going direct from raw essence of audio and video to the media server, API saves a few hundred milliseconds, about four to 500 milliseconds. And what we found that we can come and see a glass to glass, like I said, camera to remote personnel over a web browser, 400 milliseconds on a you know, LAN network, even at their home, even through a VPN, and about 700 milliseconds if they're over Wi-Fi. The buffer auto adjusts on the WebRTC side. The rest of the path is fixed. The WebRTC is smart enough, depending on how good or bad your connection and your latency is, it automatically adjusts uh, to accommodate for that. RIST ensures perfect reproduction where it counts uh, to wherever the main video processing is, to some distribution points, and it could also be used for other destinations after it's been produced, and we'll cover that in just a bit. But the WebRTC sort of thing it's okay to have packet lob, uh, frame drops. Uh, it's, it's not going live, but it's critical for it to uh, reach a destination very quickly. So wrist is dear to the hearts of the VSF, and we'll just do a quick refresher on how it works. It's just one slide, I promise. So a wrist is for UDP or RTP, in this case, video or audio. Uh, it's network protocol format is UDP. This, of course, is much faster than TCP protocols so, such as HLS or DASH over TCP. Even the HLS low latency and everything they promise is, it, it never reaches the level uh, that we have achieved here with the WebRTC pure UDP transmission. UDP doesn't have all the back and forth acknowledgements uh, or automatic slowdowns when missing a packet, when a missing packet is detected. And uh, it's important to know that even the HTTP version three that was just proposed last week has built-in native support for UDP. So it's all catching up, you know, they're realizing that it's, UDP has to be a critical part of these support transmissions. Now bear in mind, UDP packets, since there's no acknowledging mechanism, 
uh, data can be dropped. And the reason for error correction protocols such as RIST is to add support for re-requests of those missing or corrupted packets. As a backwards error correction protocol, RIST works through a, de a delay buffer. And uh, Libris in particular uh, uses by default a dynamic buffer. So when the network conditions are good, uh, it can keep that buffer and the delay very small. Uh, but if the network conditions deteriorate, it can increase the buffer in the background so that the viewer doesn't even notice a problem in most cases. Uh, obviously, this dynamic buffer doesn't work well in a production workflow where uh, the receiver is, is re relying on constant uh, uh, latency. But in the cases where this risk protocol is used purely to feed endpoints that have WebRTC, a dynamic buffer is perfectly acceptable, and the browser accommodates it without any problems. Uh, we do want to give you uh, a look at our web uh, user interface for Librist. Since that was also a factor in the customer's choice, the, the ease of use, configuration, et cetera, of the entire solution, uh, Librist is free and open source. And I'm actually the principal architect and maintainer of the library as well. The web GUI that I'm going to show you is our proprietary GUI that is put on top of it. But under the hood, it's the exact same open source binary. Uh, we don't use a custom or modified you know, object in any way. It's the exact same you would get for the, from the repository uh, that you can use by hand. So our GUI pretty much takes, uh, maximizes the functionality that's already in the open source library. This is a screenshot of our typical configuration for the error correction protocol. You can build up to 10, in this case, uh, active sources of or destinations per connector or per tunnel. Uh, how many connectors you have depend upon the hardware and, of course, the licensing that you have on, uh, on our machines. But the under, there's no limit in the library itself. You, we just figured that 10 was a good number that should cover almost every scenario when you try to do pairing to uh, 10 different places. You can do load balancing or you can do redundancy. Uh, the GUI, as you can see here on the bottom, gives you control over all the bells and whistles of the protocol uh, that you typically don't use on, you know, if you have the command line. Even the complicated ones, you can set encryption options, different passphrase for each peer uh, if you want. It also supports, supports a very secure authorization process. Uh, it includes a tool very much like HT password for that authentication process. It lets you set up which side will be the listener, which is different than the receiver. Uh, the listener just listens to the other side to initiate the connection, and then whichever side is the sender just starts sensing the data. This makes, this makes connections where one side is not added much easier. Um, and the web GUI even lets you set up very complicated options, so that, such as split and redundant path, when you have more than one gateway or service provider and you want to achieve full redundancy on your transmission. Uh, we should also mention that, uh, reluctantly, our GUI supports both RIST and SRT. <laughs> that opens the door and lets our, our equipment into the rack. And uh, the typical scenario that we've seen is that once we're in and we show them, you know, why don't you give RIST a try and compare? They never go back once they try it. But having, uh, having SRT basically opens the door for the appliance to come in. Let's go back to WebRTC uh, because uh, it made this case study possible in the first place, right? RIS was only a helper. The, the big heavy lifting guy for the solution was our WebRTC technology. So for many users, the best selling point of WebRTC is that it's supported directly in the web browser. No plugin or software to install. Pretty much all modern browsers on all platforms, even mobile, will play WebRTC as long as you feed it the correct codecs, as long as you feed it the correct video and audio codec, which has to be fine-tuned to be universally accepted by all devices. And that's what we perfected in our process, because we, we build the encoders, we're able to integrate uh, everything together and have a universally playable WebRTC link. 
Additionally, uh, the WebRTC protocol is very customizable. In fact, uh, actually, we have the equivalent of adjustable bit rate for WebRTC built into our encoder, media server, and playback engine. Uh, but that's a story for another day because it's, it's not used in this case, in this particular use case. Uh, unlike other WebRTC servers out there, we can support thousands of simultaneous connect connections, even on a small machine. One of the biggest issues that uh, uh, early adopters of WebRTC have encountered is that the other solutions out there are not scalable. Because unlike something like uh, HTTP protocol, which is uh, stateless, that you, know, you can handle thousands of uh, requests on a machine, WebRTC is a stateful protocol. It keeps a UDP connection open with a video transmission to every customer. And we've managed to, uh, to make that very, very scalable. Uh, the speed in our encoder media server combination makes it ideal for remote support personnel. By speed, I mean, I mean the low latency in which we deliver uh, the streams. And as an extra, I th we think we're the only WebRTC media server that supports ad, ad insertion, multi bit rate, and even Chromecast. When you're playing from our WebRTC player, you can Chromecast to a TV on your, on your own network. Uh, it's all about speed, and we have some unique tricks that can, put, that can cut hundreds of milliseconds from the media pass when the media server <coughs> is used with our encoder. So a couple of final notes. Uh, we, we just finished installing a few hundred of our own set-top boxes at this customer's New York headquarters as well. Uh, our set-top box is actually a Raspberry Pi in a very cute metal case that attaches to the back of any HDMI monitor. Uh, it has a, a fancy Bluetooth remote which works just like a TV remote control. Uh, we used Linux instead of a standard Android build to make uh, the this, this solution more customizable. And uh, the good thing about these internal feeds that go into the set dot box as, is that now we can use REST and a VLC client under the hood to play and synchronize uh, viewing using the set dot boxes. When you have several people in the same room or adjacent room viewing the same program, it gets very annoying if the audio goes out of sync with one place, you know, uh, at an offset with uh, somebody on the same channel. So the room gets full of echoes, etc. So we use the time coding built into RIS, the time coding capabilities built into RIS to synchronize playback so that they're all within one frame of each other, no matter what. Uh, there's also various levels of authorization and security so that some groups are allowed access to some programs, uh, others to other programs, and so forth. Uh, the hierarchical nature of uh, the menus in the set-top box matches the HTML that we put on our front end so that all the remote personnel, whether they're in the set-top boxes or in the web browser, which is a bulk of the users, have a similar experience. So to sum up, let me just read these bullet points. Uh, Speed over RTC supports the immediacy that the remote engineers and producers needed. WebRTC is so ridiculously easy for all users that anyone can use it. You just click, you, you saw it downstairs on the demo as well of, uh, of the VSF uh, forum booth that with a simple QR code, you can open a stream. And during Ciro's presentation yesterday, that's exactly the technology we're using here. You don't even need to type uh, the URL. You can put a QR code and it opens up. Uh, RIS played a key role in faithful transport to the cloud and to further distribution points when it was needed, when absolute perfection was needed. And uh, that's it. I think we have uh, time for some questions now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions? So one, one of your slides, you had a variable latency wrist. Is that, is that right? But on one of the slides? Correct. Is that, is that something you've made up? Because that's not in normal RIST, right? It is, it is. It, it's the defaults are, that we recommend are not for that type of ultra low latency transmission. But you can set up the, everything on the RIST protocol to be as low latency as you want. 
but it's all a matter of, you know, typically uh, any implementation is going to have loops with the, uh, you know, that go every few milliseconds, however it is, and unless that, those loops are smaller than your latency, you cannot achieve those small buffers. In the case of the Libris library, we can achieve, uh, we, you can, we can have a, a buffer of 50 milliseconds and still recover five times, no problem. No, no, I, I think you didn't quite get, so you had a slide where you say you do dynamic latency on, on, in, in RIST. Is, is Correct. That, but that, that's not in, in the, that's not a, a, thing, a thing, that's a thing you've come up in your own implementation, right? Correct, but our implementation does not violate the spec. The spec left the door open yeah. uh, because okay. it doesn't require that your buffer st stay static. So that is our own implementation. It is inside Libris, and it's controlled by you set up a minimum and a maximum buffer size as the parameters of the Libris library. And you will go ahead and measure in real time, 10 times per second, the RTT, yeah. and we'll keep that buffer about six, uh, six times that size, no matter what. On, on the typical connections that we do for do you, broadcast. You, so, so if it's, sorry, if it's, sorry to interrupt. So if it's risk with TS, how, how do you maintain your TS starts going like this, right? That's why you know, it's only applicable for when the player can, can support variable buffers like WebRTC. When the, but this, sorry, I'm, I'm confused. We can discuss this after. I'm a bit confused yeah. what WebRTC has to do with risk for, now. For regular MPEG TS receivers, you're right. And we configure the MPEG TS receivers to have a fixed yeah. Uh, same min and max buffer, it's a fixed size buffer no matter what. But for other types of receivers or for other types of playback mechanisms that can adjust to variable buffers, it works. Okay. Okay, great. All right, Sergio, thank you very much. Appreciate it.